Alright boys and girls, welcome on back for a little bit more Flip Class Lightning Round. Thank you guys so much for watching these. I know we're on a short time scale and your time is very precious to me so I'm going to blow through a lot of this information very very quickly and then focus mostly on the parts that I feel are most important for you to know before tomorrow. So, we're going to talk about classification today. It is a very complicated system. For the most part, it's this guy, Carl Linnaeus, came up with this whole thing called taxonomy. And in this thing called taxonomy, he invented this thing called binomial nomenclature. That's really easy because bi means two, nomial means name, nomenclature means naming system. So it's a two-name naming system. Bam! Easy. Before then, though, there were other people that thought other things like Aristotle and other people, and all of it was pretty much wrong and crazy. If you want to see that again, uh, you know, just pause the video right here. You can read that, but that. So let's talk about the taxon. We grouped everything into taxons, and a taxon is really just a fancy word for a group. It's primarily based on their physical features because back in the day that's all you could really see. Now don't get me wrong, they cut them up and look at, you know, body structures and stuff like that, but still, you know, no genetic data, no evolutionary history because these weren't things that people even knew about yet. So there's two main problems here. You're limited to features you can see. Now as technology increased, our ability to see these features increased, but we did miss a whole lot of different features. The other problem is that you're going to have some organisms with similar niches in different parts of the world, so therefore they could evolve to have similar looking features, although they're not actually really related at all. And that's called convergent evolution, this whole uh, idea of speciation where things are changing uh, separate from each other. Great example, all these ant-eating things. In America, we got the armadillo, the actual anteater, the giant pangolin, which is the African anteater, and the spiny anteater. And even though these two here are called the anteater, they're actually not really related to each other really at all. And all these things look all crazy and have a big weird snout thing, but they're not from a common ancestor very, very recently. So we have this whole classification system that Linnaeus came up with. You can remember it using the mnemonic King Philip came over for great soup. Notice that great and soup are in italics, and the S on soup is lowercase. There is a reason for that. The king is for kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, on species. These are the taxons. These are the different grouping levels. You can think of it like, you know, world, region, or world, continent, region, country, the state, county, town. There. Got it. So it's just different levels of classification. And when we name things using the two-name naming system, this is what we use. We write the genus and the species, and the species has to be in the lowercase. For example, uh, you've heard of E. coli. That would be a type of bacterium. The E is for Escherichia, which I'm not even going to try to spell, but that's actually the genus. Coli is a species because it's the Escherichia genus that lives in your colon, which is back here. So, like we said before, we had some problems with this, so we invented this whole field of what we call cladistics. Cladistics is using a phylogeny, but it's using physical characteristics, but it also accounts for genetic similarities, for chemical relationships. And it also accounts for evolutionary history, this whole idea of like, how did this one form? Was it from this one? Did it gain traits from here or did we lose traits from here? And so a common moniker that gets used are like more advanced versus more the less advanced, but instead we actually use derived is the appropriate terminology versus basal. Basal being at the base towards the, you know, the, the very origin of life, these like weird archaic bacteria floating around in the ocean, and derived being traits that have been derived or adapted by evolution and natural selection over ancient times. So there's the official terminology when you see like what's a derived trait, I'm talking about things that have evolved. If you see which one of these is most basal, those are things that are farther back in the timesies. And so, like we said, those have been adapted by natural selection to a fit their environment. And the whole idea is it's based around the assumption that all living things have these common 
ancestors. That you can go back in time and you can see an organism that's very similar to the organism you're looking at, or maybe if you go back far enough, not so similar, but the, you know, these branching tree ideas. Schroederstadt, we must talk about Darwin again. So here is a picture of middle-aged Darwin. Sorry, not young and hot Darwin, but middle-aged Darwin with his big old grandpa balding going on. But this is a picture that actually came right out of the notes that he was taking his little field journal while he was out and about around the uh, voyage of the HMS Beagle. And you see here this diagram that he pretty much kind of invented. This is uh, one that perhaps he could have been using talking about the different adaptive radiation of the finches. That idea that you have this common type finch found everywhere and then you have those weird finches with all the different kinds of beaks. Yeah, from the last lecture. What's extra crazy is that this is pretty much exactly the diagram that we use now that Darwin actually, you know, we just found this in his notes. We came up with this independently later. And Alfred Wessel Wallace, who was another Englishman doing the Darwin thing, being on a ship like the Beagle, being their naturalist, actually came up with the same idea and had this same scrawling in his journal, but these two weren't in communication with each other because they were like across the ocean and it was like wooden ship time. So we have basically adapted this idea into the idea of we've got these three main domains, sort of a super classification system over top of kingdoms. So you have your six major kingdoms, there's more, but there's six major kingdoms, and those six major kingdoms can be broken down into the different domains. If you look in here, you can actually see the major different kingdoms in here. You've got the animal kingdom, fungus kingdom, uh, protists, and plants. Uh, cyanobacteria, that's a fun bacteria. Heterotrophic bacteria, this would be bacteria that feeds off of you. And then here we have the archaea bacteria. These are like the original thing on the world. And as you can see in this branching diagram, it sort of splits off from some original species that we may or may not have any idea of what it is or what it could possibly be. Here's another picture that shows you those major uh, kingdoms again, the uh, archaea, and etc., etc., plants, fungus, blah, blah, blah. But you can see it's broken down into the three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Eukarya being all the eukaryotes, being all the things that have the nucleus. So you can see they're showing you like five kingdoms here. Uh, we go with six because we break uh, down Monera into two different kinds, into archaea bacteria and you bacteria. It's a bacteria that make you sick. Here's another diagram. You can see why we call it the tree of life because it looks like a tree branching out from the middle of the thing. These are all pictures of cladograms. Here's one that looks like a circle. Here's another one. It's a cladogram. Look at this cladogram being all cladogrammy. You can see this is the uh, showing the evolutionary relationships between the chimp and hagfish which aren't really that close to related at all, so this would be like a really long chain or a split. But what I like about this one is sometimes you'll see they put little traits in there. So you can see at this point between hagfish and perch somewhere is where jaws were invented. So everything beyond this point has jaws. After the perch, which have gills, we got to the salamander, which has lungs. So everything beyond this point here, including salamander, lizard, pigeon, mouse, chimp, and everything on, has lungs. So you can sort of see the pattern whenever trait is in here, like here, like fur and mammary glands. After this point, everything on the cladogram has fur and mammary glands, like, you know, mammals, mammary, mammals. That's why we're called mammals, child tribe. So that's another picture of a cladogram. Yay, cladogram. Here's a picture of a cladogram. They can look all branchy and sideways like this, or they can look all branchy and vertical like this. Doesn't matter. They're cladograms. Another cladogram. There it is being all cladogrammy. This actually shows the evolution of the humans and the evolutionary relationships within our own genus, which is homo. Got to underline it because I don't have italics for my pen. We are homo sapiens. Again, capital H for the genus, lowercase s. So we still use that two-name naming system, but here's us, modern man. We can actually track the evolution all the way back for our genus 
and for chimpanzees, which are pretty close, they're like 98% the same as us, genetically speaking, like chemically, they're 98% the same as us, weird. We can track back to some kind of unidentified common ancestor that we're pretty sure is out there, but we haven't found any fossil evidence for yet, which is what I love about this whole theory, is that we're still finding evidence, and every time we find evidence, like this whole area here, this was all blacked out, like there was nothing here just 25 years ago. And we keep finding more evidence that continues to fit our theory of evolution and speciation over time at the hands of natural selection. Thanks for watching everybody. I tell you what, this one's going to be a little longer because I've got another one after this that we're going to fly right into right here, right now. So I'll let you off easy. No Moodle this time. No Moodle. You're welcome. I'll put it up there. You don't have to do it. You got questions, you put them in the Moodle. Again, you do not have to. Hey, Mr. Patterson, do we have to Moodle? No, you don't. You don't have to Moodle. I'm getting some water, though, because I'm getting thirsty. In the lab you guys are going to do today, you're going to make me some Venn diagrams using these baggies. The official name of the lab is called Cladogram in a Bag. You can Google it. That's what I did. In order to do this lab, we need to understand what a Venn diagram is. Here is a Venn diagram. You've seen these before. you got the same in the middle, different on each side. In class, I would do like a funny example comparing me to some other thing that's clearly not as awesome as me, but whatever. You can also have Venn diagrams that look like this. You've got burning. You've got evacuation. There's A and C fit within burning and evacuation. And then there's B, which has both. These are all off a webcomic called the index that I really like. See that you got branding, see it's a joke. Evacuation, you have fire drill, but if you combine branding and fire drill type things with burning and evacuation, that would be a tasering. Or I think that's actually just called a tasing. See, it's funny, because I found it on the internet. It makes it funny. Here's a Venn diagram where A and B are separate from each other, but they have something in common that we're calling C. So A are the good times, B are the bad times. What do they both have in common? They won't last. So you can see, right, A and B are separate from each other, but they both have something in common. C. Here's another one that's very much like that. A, B, and C all have something in common, which we're calling D, which is labeled down here. D being, well, it's not as funny as you read D first. You got stamps, tweezers, and courage. Seemingly having nothing in common. Stamps and tweezers, maybe, you know, both could be used to remove... I don't know. Both, yeah, I got nothing. A and B, C, courage, clearly has nothing to do with stamps and tweezers. But what they all have in common, well, that would be D. You know you have it, but it's hard to find when you need it. You guys are going to do something very similar. I'm going to give you a group of cards of uh, different animals. And you're going to come up with what they all have in common. With the one out here being the least in common. Whatever's in here has everything in common with everything inside of it, all the way down to the ones that are on the inside here, have all the traits of this one out here, and all the traits of the other ones. And we're using the baggies that I threw on the floor to show that. So you can use these baggies like they're cladogram. Now, I'm going to turn on the lights. The camera's going to do a little Tabascus action for a second, but don't be scared. Here we go. Point at the table. So you got these baggies 